back to another episode of the Gillette Health Podcast. Today we're going to be trying to stay on topic. We're going to try and talk about thyroid and try and talk about heart disease, risk factors, and basically everything under that umbrella of heart disease. So this will be a fun one, uh, but please forgive us if we go off on tangents as we tend to do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's talk about thyroid hormone to get to go first. We get a ton of questions about this. Um, as a background, the thyroid hormone is an ancillary hormone that has to do with cellular activity in pretty much every system in the body. It is the thyroid gland itself is a small butterfly-shaped gland on the neck. If you feel it when you swallow, it kind of feels like a slice of deli meat sliding over your windpipe. And depending on the tissue, your thyroid hormone, or T4, is converted to active thyroid hormone, or T3, based upon three different enzymes. So you have um, tissue-dependent levels of thyroid hormone as well. Yeah, and uh, just to back up and talk about you know the, the incidence of thyroid issues, it isn't all that common, but it's also not uncommon. So you know, the number of people that would swing towards either a hyperthyroid state where they're producing too much thyroid hormone yeah. versus a hypothyroidism state uh, greatly favors hypothyroidism, something like, you know, uh, in the realm of five plus or minus percent of people will have either clinical hypo or subclinical hypothyroidism. And then in terms of hyperthyroidism, that's a smaller piece of the pie, something like, you know, one or two percent of people will uh, have hyperthyroidism at some point. Mm -hmm. So it's not super common. It's not 50 percent like you might be led to believe by some influencers who want to you know, fix everybody's thyroid, um, but it's also not uncommon. It really can affect your health and quality of life. Mm -hmm. The theory behind why hypo and actually hyperthyroidism develops is kind of like a spark and fuel theory. So there's all these different antibodies. There's antibodies for Graves, there's antibodies for Hashimoto's, and then 10 to 15% of people with no thyroid pathology and no lymphocytic infiltration, which is classic for Hashimoto's, the most common named hypothyroidism, um, about 10 to 15 percent of people with no pathology have elevated levels of these antibodies as well. Yeah, so basically an antibody is something your body is producing uh, against something that's not really a pathogen, not mm -hmm. something that it needs to be attacking. And in the case of like true Hashimoto's, this can lead to lymphocytic infiltration of the yeah. thyroid and damage over time, fibrosis, which is replacing the functional thyroid tissue with scar tissue that's not gonna be producing thyroid hormone. But as you know, Kyle mentioned, there are a number of people that have these antibodies and they don't actually have thyroid pathology. It's not actually causing damage. So you know, I guess the question is, so what do you do with those people? Let's say somebody comes in, they like, uh, I was told I have Hashimoto's, I don't wanna take medicine, or I don't wanna take medicine without getting a second opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I have these antibodies, here's my blood work, what do I do? So there's a spark, but not necessarily a fire. And a lot of times these individuals, rightfully so, look for the cause of this. This is kind of bread and butter functional medicine, if you will. You're looking to address the cause rather than just treat the symptom or throw a medication or a tool at them. And there's a lot of theories behind this. One of the better ones, in my opinion, is that your immune system is like your military and it runs drills like any good military should. And the drills that it runs is usually against your microbiome both the good, the bad, and the intermediate microbes in your gut. And then um, if you look at you know, periods of infection where your immune system is hyperactive, after those sorts of infections, autoimmune diseases can be more commonly onset after that. So I look at the infection or just periods of high inflammatory markers or inflammation as the fuel that kind of ignites that spark and then it picks up and uh, ends in Hashimoto's, uh, this theory is also true of type one diabetes, and it is also true of multiple sclerosis, and it is also true of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So and that's kind of an overarching theme. We don't need to dive into that super deep, but that is a very common question that patients ask and should continue asking. Yeah, it's always, there's no you know, dumb questions. If you're, you're asking a question, the odds are somebody else has that question and you know, if you have a provider that's going to take the time and listen to you, listen to your concerns and answer your questions, then you, know, you found somebody that you can probably have a good working relationship with for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 
I think you mentioned you know, recent infections, particular viral infections can trigger these antibodies sometimes, whether that's how, uh, autoantibodies like thyroglobulin or thyroid peroxidase antibodies, or whether that's you know, just a positive ANA if somebody's trying to find out if they have an autoimmune condition or not. So looking at that in the context of, you know, well, by now, perhaps we've all had a recent viral illness, so it, it makes the water even further muddied. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Um, speaking of muddy waters, um, there's a little bit of a debate on when to initiate thyroid medication and, of course, which medication to initiate as well. But let's chat about some of the pros and cons of early versus late initiation. And also, a lot of people ask, well, do I have to do this and when would I have to? Yeah, so typically the conversation around initiating medication, like if somebody has a suppressed TSH and your resting heart rate is 180, that's the time, the time to initiate medication would be yesterday. <laughs> but today is the next best time to get started yeah. there. So in hyperthyroid, it's fairly clear. Uh, hypothyroid is what we're talking more about whenever there's a little bit of um, wiggle room. So uh, if somebody has a, let's say a single TSH reading that is five. Um, so by some guidelines, they're subclinically hypothyroid um, some guidelines would say, well, no, if the T4 is normal, then that's normal. You don't mm -hmm. need to do anything about it. If the TSH goes above 10, then that's when you can consider initiating yeah. therapy. And in truth, most people that have a TSH between 5 and 10, they're not at risk of, you know, super, you know, like they're not at risk of a lot of complications from being hypothyroid. They're not going to be you know, having their metabolism slow to a crawl. They're mm -hmm. not going to develop you know, heart failure from a lack of thyroid. They're not going to go into a myxedema coma from a, a lack of thyroid hormone at those yeah. levels. But it can impact your quality of life. You, you, know, you could have a bit of sluggishness and digestion. You could have a bit of cold intolerance, lower energy levels. So it can impact you. But if I have someone who, you know, they have a TSH of you know, seven, maybe it's just a one-off reading and we say, you know, you know, how do you feel? Are you checking any of these boxes? And they're like, no, no, never felt better in my life. If I was any healthier, vitamins would be taking me. Oh, then uh, I'm not going to initiate treatment. We will, you know, recheck that because a lot of times you will see a, an isolated spike once in a while because, you know, you're looking at just a snapshot in time. Yeah. So, you know, somebody may have a, a TSH of seven and then you check it a few months later, the TSH is down at a two. Mm -hmm. Of note, biotin supplementation. Uh, biotin, which is a B vitamin, it can raise TSH, it cross-reacts with the assay. So we usually have patients stop their biotin supplement within several days of their thyroid test. And then uh, on a related note, most practitioners have their patients take their thyroid medication after their thyroid test as well, particularly if you take T3 as part of your medication. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, that's an important thing for people to know about is that if you're taking biotin, it could lead to a, a false positive and mm -hmm. unnecessary further testing or unnecessary yep. medication. Um, but I think the original question was, you know, you know when to treat. So um, if somebody, you know, goes in and they have a, the TSH of five, it's the first reading, and you have someone who is trigger happy, uh, we'll just use that term for um, treating somebody with thyroid hormone, uh, then you could have somebody who ends up on a medication unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they do okay with it. Maybe they have some side effects. You know, there's a potential for harm to occur there. If you have someone who is, you know, waiting to treat somebody who is profoundly symptomatic mm -hmm. and there's not another cause of, you know, the fatigue or depression, whatever it may be, until the TSH touches 10, so at 9.9, .9, you know, you're good to go, we'll check it again next year, mm -hmm. then you're you know, really just taking the quality of life from that person, and that's yep. the risk there. So you don't want to put everybody on thyroid as soon as you see an abnormal TSH, but you don't want to wait until it's uh, obvious, you know, hypothyroidism um, that's progressed for several years before you, you know, start to initiate medication and then there's a conversation about which medication do you initiate because mm -hmm. in general there's T4 which is levothyroxine. Um, thyroxine is mostly what your thyroid produces about 90 to 95 percent. There is 
lyothyronine, which is the synthetic T3, which is the active thyroid hormone. Uh, so some people are on levothyroxine monotherapy, other people are on lyothyronine monotherapy, and then you have people who are on a, a mixture, whether mm -hmm. that's synthetic or whether that's natural desiccated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times before you just empirically put a patient on T3 or cytomel or desiccated thyroid as well, you want to make sure that they have good sources of iodine, not too much, not too little, adequate sources of selenium as well. Selenium is the coenzyme or the catalyst for the, react, for the deiodinase enzyme reaction of T4 to T3 so that your body can make its own T3. Some people talk about T2 and T1, but um, systemically or medically those are insignificant. They're really only significant in the tissue level or from a scientific standpoint. And uh, another good uh, rule, if you will, is that if the patient is symptomatic and there's an in-between, there's a gray zone of whether or not the objective markers look off, then you start if they're symptomatic. And then you also look at things like a history of AFib or arrhythmia, or even just um, in an older age group, um, does this individual have a lot of palpitations? So you're looking for things um, that would be a red flag for side effects occurring. Yeah, certainly if, if somebody in general, if somebody is older, they're going to be more likely to have side effects from thyroid hormone. There's a more narrow therapeutic window, whereas somebody who's younger, you have um, more margin for error, as it were. So in terms of you know, the way I look at it, you know, if somebody is symptomatic, um, a trial of you know, thyroid hormone, whenever there is some gray area, like you said, is reasonable. And then if you see the symptoms resolve, the person's like, oh, this is how I should have been feeling, mm -hmm. and your lab work is showing some improvements there that correlate, then, you know, congratulations, you, you tr successfully treated the patient. If you put them, and they're in the gray zone, you put them on thyroid hormone, and they feel worse, they're like, I'm too wound up, I'm anxious, I'm having side effects, or they notice nothing, then there's another cause there that needs to be explored, or you've given them too much medication. So. Mm -hmm kind of have to, to go back and see, okay, what, what went wrong here? What are some other things that could be going on that maybe weren't in your first differential? Another thing to consider when you're starting your thyroid medication is, is something else off. For example, is SHBG off? Thyroid medication can increase SHBG, which binds androgens and estrogens. Or is your thyroxine binding globulin off? So. Um, just like SHBG, there is a binding protein. We can call it TBG to simplify things. And this TBG will bind both T3 and T4. You can look at your ratio of T3 and T4 and free T3, free T4 unbound. And you can somewhat estimate it, the, the, binding, the binding globulin as well. But when you're on thyroid hormone medication, you can um, have a good assessment of what this individual's physiology is likely or not likely to do. Desiccated thyroid hormone usually comes in a ratio of, I believe, uh, four to one, T4 to T3. And then of course, um, levothyroxine is 100% T4. Li-iodothyronine or cytomel is 100% T3. And your body in general ends up converting a ratio of around 10 to one. So those are good things to keep in mind for each individual's regimen. Yeah, and you know, some people will look at the reverse T3. That's something that we will look at, yeah. um, and it doesn't always correlate with the clinical picture. So it's important to not just get caught up in the numbers uh, and you know, too much of an algorithmic medicine, but looking at the patient in front of you. Um, but for some people, you know, levothyroxine, just plain old Synthroid, works very well, and they're well managed on that. For some people, you know, and I think we've both seen some examples of this where you give somebody or somebody comes to you on levothyroxine and you see a, a relatively low level of free T3, uh, free lyothyronine, and then you see a, a quite high level of reverse T3. Uh, and sometimes this could be due to an you know, inflammatory state or metabolic dysfunction where it's just getting shuttled down, you know, the wrong pathway. So fixing that, you know, getting them to optimal health more than likely is going to help them convert appropriately, but there is a subset of patients, and again, I would say it's a rather small subset that 
uh, does do better with a combination of T4 and T3. Absolutely. And there's a couple small population and, and some studies that people like to point to. Well, you know, people lose you know more weight on the the T4 T3, um, and you know if you have somebody who is hypothyroid struggling with weight, then mm -hmm. you know maybe that makes sense to, yep. to have a mixture. Uh, but if you have somebody because you can have people that are quite thin that also have hypothyroid, mm -hmm. then giving them something that's associated with weight loss may not make the most sense. Another good way to look at it is in uh, incongruence with that, the more narrow the therapeutic window, the less likely you are to be able to optimize your thyroid. So just like with your sex hormones, androgen and estrogen, and optimizing them and aiming for not just not deficient, but the optimal range, you can do that with thyroid hormone. It's just harder to do if you use more and more T3 because it kind of shortens the therapeutic window. Yeah, and in particular because the T3 has a short half-life, typically it's dosed multiple times a day. Um, if you use a sustained release T3, then you're kind of you know, pegged to whatever the quality of the pharmacy you're using is. So you do want to make sure there's some careful follow-up there. Definitely. And some of the data is actually starting to show that there is a sweet spot, an optimal level for thyroid. It's more than just the, the TSH. So yep. there was a recent paper looking at insulin sensitivity in, in diabetics and those that had uh, you know, thyroid replacement to where the TSH was normal, but the T4 was on the lower end of the range. Uh, they tended to have more insulin resistance. You get a very small study, but it's hypothesis generating. Um, and then if you have people who are over replaced where the TSH is suppressed, I believe the cutoff is like below 0 0.5, mm -hmm. they do tend to have more arrhythmias and a, a higher incidence of, you know, some uh, cardiac, not necessarily lipid disorders, but just cardiac dysfunction because you are putting extra stress on the cardiovascular system yep. um, by, you know, revving up your sympathetic nervous system with thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. uh, diabetes and insulin resistance are uh, and obesity as well that's certainly a case where you want to optimize your thyroid hormone profile if you can you optimize it as much as you can pregnancy is another similar case to that kind of for different reasons but uh, during pregnancy um, we've talked about hcg or pregnil before and it is actually a very similar molecule to tsh and it does bind to the tsh receptor in most doses where individuals will take HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin, it will not have a profound effect on thyroid hormone because it's relatively weak. But in pregnancies, the level of HCG is extremely high. And as HCG doubles every 48 hours, it's spiking and it's spiking. This is the normal mechanism for an individual with uh, a normal thyroid to increase thyroid hormone production by 30 or 40%. Um, precipitously throughout the first trimester. Right, and this is why when you have the women who are planning to become pregnant or become pregnant and they are treated for hypothyroidism, that they're not going to have the response to HCG that somebody without hypothyroidism would, so their dosages yep. will tend to increase. Yep. So that's a very important consideration. Um, another thing is that after pregnancy, there's a relatively high rate of thyroid dysfunction. Really and um, even the in induction sometimes of thyroid autoantibodies. Yep. So when that happens, and, and this is somewhere in the margin of I believe about 10 to 12 percent, mm -hmm. it's been a while since I looked at the figures, but um, you'll see a perhaps a transient hyperthyroid state, mm -hmm. maybe just a euthyroid state, but then um, the levels of thyroid hormone can start to drop off and you can move into a subclinical hypothyroid state that sometimes resolves, most of the time resolves, yep. uh, but sometimes does not. So uh, quite a common presentation is, you know, a, a woman will say, uh, well, you know, after my second child, that's when everything fell apart, or after my third child, that's when everything fell apart. And I think there's multiple mechanisms at play there. You know, perhaps sometimes it is the thyroid. Other times it is, you know, you get used to your body's weight point, set yep. point being 50 pounds heavier. Mm -hmm. And then that sort of, you know, your, your body's trying to maintain homeostasis there and you're consuming yep. more food. Sometimes it's related to thyroid, sometimes not, but it's something to look at and, and test for. Yeah. The six week postpartum visit is a great time to 
to do a test for not, not only thyroid, but also for ferritin to see if you've recovered iron um, during pregnancy. A lot of the micronutrients and macronutrients as well are depleted. So you don't want to be in a state of micronutrient or vitamin deficiency and starvation because your body may consume unnecessarily more macronutrients trying to find those nutrients. So six week postpartum visit, a great time to do that. The um, confirmed pregnancy test, much more before the initial 12 week visit. But as soon as you confirm, that is another great time to get a full thyroid panel and look at iron homeostasis as well and to get a urinalysis not to go too far off topic. But if you're thinking about your most common reasons for miscarriage, luteal phase defect and NK cell hyperplasia are not necessarily the most common. Um, if there's three or four or five miscarriages, maybe you look at more like antiphospholipid antibody syndromes or like lupus anticoagulant. But your, your main two are really uh, asymptomatic bacteria where there's um, bacteria in the urine and the bladder or um, hypothyroidism this is a very common cause of miscarriage as well. Uh, and in fertility in general, you know, people are always asking about, you know, what do you need to do before you, you know, opt or to optimize fertility before you conceive. And mm -hmm. now I, I've heard it you know, time and time again from patients. It's like, yep, I got started on thyroid hormone and then I got pregnant. So yep. that doesn't mean that if you're having trouble getting pregnant to take thyroid hormone, but it could be part of what is contributing to that. And yep. the way to find out is to get tested. Yep. There's a lot more than just a low dose of Clomid or Letrozole and a progesterone at the end of the cycle. There's many, many other things, bromocryptine, cabergoline, controlling prolactin, controlling thyroid hormone, modulating SHBG, insulin sensitivity. Um, so there's a lot of other things to think about. So just like, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't just empirically start a regimen. You should get labs, look at the objective data, look extensively at the history, and then come up with a good plan. It's also pretty common for, um, Again, not to delve too far off topic, you know, get your HSG, which is basically dye that's shot through the uterus and the fallopian tubes. To, um, well, one, just to make sure that there's no structural defect. And then two, it does kind of clean out the pipes. And a lot of times you have pregnancies or chemical pregnancies or um, you have conception happening, but there's still something else that needs identified uh, via your uh, team of professionals. Yeah, I think those are really important points, and I think there'll be a subset of listeners that you know can really look into some of those things if they are struggling with mm -hmm. fertility. I think most people would stand to do very well just by optimizing their, their diets, getting their metabolic health optimized, and then having a preconception visit. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into that topic at yeah. a different time in a so, different podcast. I think this is a great segue into our next segment, which is cardiovascular disease. So we're going to ruffle some feathers, we'll talk about particle size, we'll talk about the carnivores, do your cholesterol levels matter? Um, mm -hmm. That's a good question to start with. So do your cholesterol levels matter? Yes. All right, what's the next question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, end of discussion, and that's our segment on heart disease. Uh, no, but there's a bit of nuance to it, and there are anecdotes, there are some people who, you know, smoked all their life and they didn't have a heart attack and there are some people who had high cholesterol their whole life and they didn't have a heart attack um, but I, I saw a, a post that was similar to this the other day and it made me think it's like yeah you know your your grandpa may have smoked and had high cholesterol but he also worked out in his fields for eight hours a day and was in terrific shape you know compared to the yep. relative population today um, you know we know that those things are risk factors you know all of the data supports it so to kind of run through you know, some of that data on the, the lipids that we're talking about used to be the LDL cholesterol that most people were looking at or total cholesterol. And now it's, there's a shift towards ApoB. Um, not everywhere, but it, I, I think it's going that way. I hope it's it going is, that it way. It is going that way. Because yeah. it's a, a more predictive marker essentially of whether you're gonna have a heart attack or a stroke, a vascular mm -hmm. event. And what you see is almost a, a straight line in terms of the higher your levels of ApoB and LDL are, then the higher your risk of developing cardiovascular disease. When I say cardiovascular disease, I just mean plaque buildup in the arteries, atherosclerosis in this context. So that's a pretty clear dose-dependent relationship there. Mm -hmm. And 
it's not just seeing that relationship, that correlation. You see also if you lower the levels of ApoB, um, and I think there's a formula, it's about for every, what, 40 points you lower your LDL cholesterol, you see a you know, something like a 20% risk reduction. Mm -hmm. I may be butchering the, the figures there, but we can put up a card and, and fix what those may be. Uh, but it's very clear just because there's been so much study that we know exactly how much lowering lowers the risk. Um, so you have people on one end of the spectrum that want to lower things as much as possible. Other people saying that you know it doesn't matter at all, that all the data points to it mattering. And this carries over even into genetics. So some people will say, well, you can't trust those studies because they're sponsored by Big Pharma. And there's truthfully really not much money to be made on statins now since most of them are generic and quite affordable. Um, but if you just look at people that are genetically, uh, they have altered cholesterol metabolism or altered mm -hmm. cholesterol production, those that overproduce cholesterol, meaning really not cholesterol, but the transport proteins, they're going to have higher apo lipoprotein B. Uh, they have much earlier and a much higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. Some people mm -hmm. with FH or familial hypercholesterolemia can have heart attacks in their 40s, 50s, even earlier. Yep. And then you see some of the lucky ones that have a, a mutation in, say, PCSK9, yep. where they clear their cholesterol very efficiently. And they have almost an immunity to cardiovascular disease. I mean, if you smoke enough and become diabetic enough, all bets are off. But mm -hmm. they seem to have quite a significant amount of protection. So um, I don't know what conspiracy is used to explain that one away. Yeah. Um, but that's the gist of it. And that's how I talk to patients about it whenever they're coming in and they say, well, I saw the, this X person that said, oh, I have high cholesterol and it doesn't matter and this and that. Yeah. Um, thinking about what matters and what does, doesn't, there's all these different hypotheses or theories, really hypotheses, but they all matter and they all come together in a additive or even a multiplicative way. So you have your lipid hypothesis, that's where you know your lipid blocks off the uh, coronary or the carotid and then either blocks it or sloughs off and then blocks it. So then you have the theory about blood clotting. So that's why some people take aspirin, among other benefits. It benefits lipoprotein A and maybe CRP just a touch as well. But anyway, instead of the cholesterol blocking all the way, you can have a blood clot block all the way or part of the way. And then on top of that, you can have kind of vasospasm, so almost like a TIA or anginal episode. And then you have your vasodilatory. So um, you, know, you lose the elasticity in your artery. You almost have rubber bands, and you lose some of that elasticity with age, so that's why some um, things that help with vasodilation can help as well. And then you have the inflammatory, so insulin resistance and inflammation. I think the best way to think about it in layman's terms is the cholesterol or the lipoprotein, you know, whatever, however you want to look at it, doesn't matter. The lipoproteins, ApoB, for example, and then the macrophages, the, the immune cells that turn into foam cells. So you have your inflammation coming in and actually making it part of the plaque, the glue, if you will. And then you have the lipoproteins or the blocks. So the blocks plus the glue makes it particularly sticky, and that's how you build the plaque wall. So if you're betting that your glue is going to be very low, the blocks are not going to matter as much. And if you have both, then you're going to build up your plaque extremely quickly, regardless of whether it's calcified or non-calcified, regardless of whether it's stable or unstable as well. So um, ideally, at least, um, you know, a According to the evidence, and also in theory, you know, a, a case of an N of one, you might be okay, but you wouldn't want to have as few blocks as you can without any deleterious effects and as little glue as you can concurrently. Yeah, and I think it's really, it, it, the way I say it is it's a numbers game. So the odds are that if you have this level, that this is your risk. Uh, and that's part of the larger algorithm. But just to look at the lipid section, we understand pretty well those risks. And some people are like, well, you know, I don't care. I'm not going to do anything to lower it. And in those cases, you can say, you know, okay, that's fine. There's no need to destroy the patient-provider relationship over that. You can monitor that. You can explain the risks. You can say, okay, uh, when you're, you know, 40 or, or 50, we'll get a, a CCTA and we'll see, like, you know, uh, was your hypothesis correct or not? It's a, yeah. a very end-of-one experiment. So is there plaque there or is there not? 
and then that's some very objective data. Um, and, and people will talk about the, the calcium scores, and they'll say, well, I had my, my CAC, and it was zero. It's like, well, you're right. also... You're 40 years old. 23 years old. Yeah. It, yeah. No time to calcify. Yeah, and I think if you look at about you know age 40, it's not a super high incidence of people that have positive mm -hmm. calcium scores. So yeah. if you do a calcium score on people who are 70 or 80, it's a very different story. You can Absolutely. Have a very high incidence of calcified plaque by that point. Um, and if you do a CCTA on a 80 year old, it's going to be a very, very high uh, likelihood that you see some stenosis there. So mm -hmm. you want to keep your arteries clear, presumably as long as you plan to be alive, whether that's 65 or whether that's 125 or whether you think you're going to you know, live forever, uh, which is a whole other podcast. I <laughs> don't want to get too far off track. Um, yeah. but, but essentially, uh, there is a bit of a, a warranty period depending on how healthy you are with your calcium score. So if you look at people who are not super high risk on average, five years after they get a calcium score of zero, there is you know, about 20% of these people who actually have a vascular event. So 80% of them are in the clear, 80% of them, or 20% of them have a, a vascular event. Um, we can put the link to that study in the description. I thought that was particularly interesting. Um, but if you have somebody who's smoking uh, and diabetic, or if they have a coagulation disorder, yep. and they have a CAC of zero, Again, very different story, very different risk profile, which is why yep. I think you and I both really individualize the cardiac risk assessment. Yep. Coagulation disorder, especially for an individual on something, for example, testosterone or estrogen, that will affect platelets and that will affect that HMGC or reductase enzyme. So testosterone will basically activate the same enzyme that statins and many lipid medications inactivate. So if you're on a estrogen or an androgen, you are on a lipid medication. So if you don't want any lipid medications, you might want to stay off of those. But um, you made a great point with a coagulation disorder. There's uh, an individual, very respected and esteemed individual named John Meadows, and he was public about having a very low calcium score. I believe it was single digit, which for his age was quite good. And he had a very healthy lifestyle and he did have a cardiac event. He had a, a heart attack. Um, despite having that low, apparently due to a coagulation disorder. Yeah, and these things can happen. Um, it, could it have been predicted? You know, we can go back in hindsight and argue that all day long. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you do want to do the things that are associated with better outcomes. I mean, uh, I'm a almost a hyper-rational person, so I want to make sure that my numbers are in the low-risk category. Uh, I don't want to take a bet that over the next 20 years in this gray zone that I'm just going to slide by and not build up plaque, even though I'm doing things like exercising and eating vegetables and fiber, I, I just don't think that that's enough to say if my cholesterol is high that I'm going to you know, skate by or get off scotch-free. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, the particle size argument, right? So if you have larger particles, then you know it doesn't matter. Um, and there was a recent uh, clip that I saw put out by, you know, I'll just say, you know, someone in the carnivore community. Mm. Uh, I won't name names, but you know, they had previously made the argument that well, they have lots of large particles, so uh, their you know, lipids are not atherogenic. Um, and then in the recent blood work, I believe it was either an NMR lipo profile or they they had maybe a small dense LDL on there, mm -hmm. and the number of small particles was also much higher than you would like to see. Hmm. So not only did they have a lot of large particles, they also had a lot of small particles. So yeah, yeah it's kind of uh, at that point you're, you know, you have to keep moving the goalposts because what you said in the past, you have know, large particles, and now you have small particles that are there. And I don't know if, if people are following along that closely, yeah. um, they're going to pick up on that. Even if the particle size itself does not matter, a high small dense LDL or a particle size being off will lead to insulin resistance, which I believe everybody agrees matters. Yeah, absolutely. And just with the particle size, another theory that I heard was, you know, you have these transport proteins and obviously a larger, I've heard people talk about them like, you know, your, your boats or things that transport yep. um, your proteins and a larger particle is going to carry more cholesterol. So if a larger particle does get into the artery, let's say there's a lower probability of it, 
say 50 percent mm -hmm. less likely to get into the artery but it carries twice as much cholesterol then your numbers cancel out you're just delivering a larger load of cholesterol into that subendothelial mm -hmm. space yep. now whether that plays out it's probably impossible to study okay. lipidologists can probably theorize about that and yep. and know much more than i do but i mean it's just not a way where i'm willing to you know, look at a person and say, oh yeah, all big particles, you know, you're good to go. Yeah. I think that would be misleading based on, you know, the evidence that I'm aware of. I agree with that. Um, if you're looking at a scenario and you're saying, you know, I'm the exact same person, do I choose 20 large HDL particles or 20 garbage trucks that are huge, or do I choose 20 tiny garbage trucks, since that's kind of what the HDL particle is, then obviously you're going to choose in, in general, the larger ones or the light, fluffy ones, whatever term you want to call. But in reality, it's not. It doesn't look like it's really a choice between the two. It's rather just a, a measure of what you discussed: how easy to enter and how much can be carried. Yeah, and certain things can make this easier. So if somebody has a glycemic excursion, your blood glucose spikes up to 200 after you hit the buffet. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't happen if you're metabolically healthy, but you know, just it does. just for yeah. sake of the argument. Um, then that's going to put you in a situation where those particles are much more likely to enter. Uh, same thing after you smoke a cigarette, yeah. those particles, you know, your, your arterial system is going to be irritated. Um, those endothelial spaces are going to be much easier for those transport proteins to get through. Yep. So those are a couple of things. And I, I really like your um, analogy of testosterone as a reverse statin. <laughs> Um, because essentially, you know, it, it does speed up that enzyme, and yeah. you can see with, with androgens in general a, a dose-dependent reaction, and people who are on very high doses of androgens, mm -hmm. not always, but will tend to have higher levels of the ApoB and LDL cholesterol transport proteins. Um, I, I like to think of the, the carnivore diet as a reverse PCSK9 inhibitor. Yeah. Um, not necessarily the direct mechanism, but you really, with that amount of saturated fat, reducing your, your LDL receptors in the liver, being able to clear out the cholesterol. Yeah. So you're going to have just a buildup in higher circulating levels, which is why we see some of these things that are like, you have a cholesterol level of you know, 600 and 500 of that's LDL, yeah. or an ApoB of over 200, 300. And we've, I've seen some of those lab works and you know, it's, it's quite alarming, um, but you do have to realize that this process happens over years and really decades. Um, but you want to spend as little time in that high-risk environment as possible. Mm -hmm. A couple other things to think about with um, lipid management and heart attack prevention. Um, not to get into too much alphabet soup, but there's also triglycerides, which is the basic unit of fat in the blood. So glucose is kind of the basic carbohydrate. And then triglycerides carries uh, glycerol backbone and then three different fatty acid chains. So it's a relatively smaller particle that is fairly easy to use and can also lead to insulin resistance as well. Depending on your genetics, you can also just tend to run higher on triglycerides. And there is some correlations between, um, you, know, you know, some people who run higher on trigs, their glucose tends not to increase as much and vice versa as well. There's a APOE genotypes, which we'll talk about at a different time, probably when we talk more about uh, neurodegenerative disease but it also matters for cardiovascular disease prevention. For example, if you're ApoE2 homozygous with two copies, then controlling your triglycerides might be more important. Whereas if you're ApoE4, two copies of that homozygous, then controlling cholesterol might be a little bit more important. Yeah, those are great points. And I, I think this is why it's difficult for us to say, okay, we're gonna carve out and talk just about heart disease because mm -hmm. there's uh, everything's interconnected, so you can't really talk about heart disease. We talked about genetics earlier with some protective yep. mutations and some uh, pathologic mutations that cause problems, and the same thing, APOE, it's not just heart disease, it also yep. affects your long-term neurocognitive health. So there's all sorts of these interconnected things. Um, another rabbit hole that I will take us down that I probably shouldn't is, you know, why do people you know, seem to swear by the carnivore diet? So. Mm -hmm. You'll see people where they're like, oh, you know, I was, you know, fat and depressed and then I started eating, you know, only steak or only steak and, and bacon or whatever it is. And they're like, and I lost this weight and I feel so much better, um, which 
it could be a good tool in the short term if that's really what works for you and you, you don't want to use other tools and you think um, you know reducing someone who's you know 50 100 pounds overweight like that's going to be a risk reduction but then um, it can be a hard sell to to take somebody off of that diet and go back to more traditional diet that's going to help their cardiac risk factors um, so what are the reasons that you think people tend to feel better when they go from a let's just face it the American diet is on average ultra processed um, to you know, eating primarily cuts of meat there's a lot of reasons one reason is that it is extremely tasty um, you can eat a lot of things that taste good and you can eat plenty of salt and electrolytes which you might not be eating enough of especially in a hot summer day like today Another reason is your blood glucose might be more stable. So you kind of have that um, beneficial cognitive effect of a ketogenic diet. You don't have a crash, you don't have insulin, as many, as many insulin spikes. And then another reason could be, there could be something in your diet that is affecting how you feel or affecting you hormonally. And the carnivore diet is obviously a very restrictive diet. I kind of put it in the same category as Whole30 where you're, goal is to not necessarily stay on that diet forever but to find out what's affecting you and what you respond well to or not as well to i tend to be more of a fan of the whole 30 diet if you're trying to um, subjectively find what foods work and don't work or objectively if you get labs while you're on it but it is a great restrictive diet and then it can also uh, improve insulin sensitivity if someone tends to overeat for example specifically carbohydrates then they're not gonna do that as much in the carnivore diet. So there's a, a lot of benefits and many people feel subjectively great while they're on it. Yeah, and people do feel great. I think probably the biggest thing is just cutting out the junk. Yeah. Um, but there's all those other niches in particularly for you know, people who have you know, autoimmune disease. There seems to be a, a subset of people who respond very well to something like that. And for them, the improvement in quality of life could be worth, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I'm willing to, you know, do this to my lipids and have this improvement in my quality of life. Um, so we could almost put together a, a risk reduction stack for people like that with some sort of yeah. dietary fiber. So, you know, you take some xylem husks yeah. so you're not absorbing all your biliary cholesterol. You know, uh, take a statin and some azetamibe or a PCSK9, and then you can have the best of both worlds. You don't yeah, have to. That is certainly <laughs> possible. Have cardiac risk just yeah. because you're controlling your autoimmune disease. Um, but I think a lot of people think of it as like a primal or ancestral diet. And if you get into the, yeah, it, it really primarily we've consumed carbohydrates. If you you go all the way back, you know, maybe in the very early you know caveman days, there was more of a, a meat intake, but maybe. Uh, it's, it's a hard sell if you actually look at the data. Yeah, the, the history of human existence is not a great reason to go on the carnivore diet. Um, autoimmune disease, potentially so, although I would wonder how it would compare with preventing relapse of autoimmune disease compared to Whole30 or compared to the autoimmune paleo protocol, also known as AIP, or even something, I believe there's one called the Bean Protocol. I did a podcast with um, unique Hammond. So there's these different protocols where individuals, uh, health coaches, nutritionists, etc., have put many people on diets other than the carnivore diets with autoimmune disease and done a phenomenal job of preventing relapse. I want to ask more about the bean diet. Is this just all cons different types of beans and that's all you eat? Uh, Perhaps we save that for another podcast where we'll cover the bean diet. Yeah, I don't uh, believe it's as exclusive as the carnivore <laughs> diet, but I, I do know that it emphasizes the importance of dietary fiber, also known as soluble fiber, and prebiotic fiber, of which FODMAP is one. So there's a little bit of a balance with that. We'll certainly get into that at a later date. Yeah, yeah, the bean diet could be a, a pro, fairly protein-rich vegetarian-style mm -hmm. diet, just kind of it's where my, my mind is going right now. I just but want to do all of them at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do the carnivore and the bean diet. I think I could live off of some uh, burnt ends and some beans. I would love it. But in any case, uh, another interesting thing that I, I uh, kind of theorize about, and I don't have great data on this, but the high intake of dietary saturated fat, it does drive some PPAR delta agonism. Um, and this is one of the reasons that a high saturated fat diet is associated with pancreatic cancer. 
Um, but we also know that there are PPAR delta agonists that are specifically developed as, you know, or they were trying to be developed as exercise in a pill. Yep. Um, so people are thinking of, you know, carterine. Uh, that's something that got news headlines when it was being developed. And, you know, these mice were resistant to metabolic syndrome. They were running so fast and so far on their wheels. And that yep. seems to translate to humans. Um, there's a couple of studies, but it, they... I don't think they're going to develop a pharmaceutical just due to the mm -hmm. cancer risk, but mm -hmm. there are people who are still taking this from research chemical companies and CrossFitters. It seems that they are able to have a lot of endurance and a lot of energy, um, and I think that there may be a subset of people on the carnivore diet who get more gene transcription mm -hmm. out of that. There, are, you know, there are SNPs for how much gene transcription you have from PPAR mm -hmm. delta. And if they're taking in a lot of saturated fat, they're getting a lot of PPAR delta, they may feel really good, mm -hmm. but at the same time, and they may be able to exercise really well, but at the same time, they're probably those that are at a higher risk of cancer unless they have some you know, other protective genes there. And really everything, I think, eventually you probably have a polygenic risk score for mm -hmm. more than just you know, cardiovascular disease. You'll have it for various disease processes. Yeah. In cases of that where you're having a very high saturated fat intake, it's particularly important to be in a caloric maintenance. So you're spending this energy, it's going through oxidative phosphorylation in your mitochondria. PPAR agonists often work in the mitochondria, whether it's a delta or an alpha or a gamma, is really just tissue specific. So if you're looking at um, you know, a delta, then often you're talking about muscle tissue especially somatic muscle tissue. Whereas if you're talking about the other ones, it might be um, the liver. So they have a lot of various benefits, but you certainly don't want too much agonism at a receptor, for example, PPAR delta, that will lead to increased cell turnover and potentially cancer. Now, that's probably more of a really long run risk, but it's just it would be extremely hard to find the balance of when that would cross over. Yeah, and you and I have spoken about this off camera before, uh, but looking at the angiotensin receptor blockers, some yeah. of those do have PPAR delta activity yeah. and other PPAR activity, but we'll just think about delta for now. Yeah. And um, here fairly recently, I, I think within the past month, there was an association that came out with high dose and longer use of um, these... Telmosartan. I don't recall if it was telmosartan. It was one of these medications in the angiotensin receptor blocker class. Mm -hmm. It may have been telmosartan at something like 80 milligrams, which is the top dose. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a small increase in your risk for you know having some sort of cancer down the line. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't huge. Like if you're looking at what the, the relative risk increase, like your hazard ratio is something like, you know, 1.1 or 1.11, something mm -hmm. like that, where you have a 10% increase, but it Still was makes me nervous. significant, and you know, it makes you think if you have somebody who is you know young and hypertensive and already at high risk for cancer, maybe they're um, obese, you know, or they're smoking, yeah. you know, and you add a angiotensin receptor blocker, um, you know, what are the implications of that? And I don't think we have the data to say for sure yet. Um, and then on the other hand, you have your ACE inhibitors like you know, lisinopril, which has been associated with a higher risk for lung cancer. So, mm -hmm. you know, what are you really going to give that person? And probably it would be a moderate dose of an ARB yep. paired with another medication like calcium channel blocker or yep. a diuretic, depending on the volume status. Yeah, I think that's a, a good balance as well. And also when you're looking at ACEs and ARBs, which has very similar mechanisms of action, and they're in an angiotensin, aldosterone system or RAAS. You also want to prevent things like too much aldosterone from building up in the kidney and then you also want to make sure that they don't affect, uh, um, they can also affect lipids to some degree but um, they also affect hemoglobin hematocrit so if you're borderline anemic or borderline hypogonadal as well then you might want to be particularly careful with these medications. Yeah and I do want to, I guess I should be fair and talk about you know, some of the arguments that have been put back against this study. Uh, they say, well, if you know, people are controlling their cardiac risk factors, controlling their blood pressure, they're going to live longer and you have to die from something. If it's not heart disease, it's going to be cancer. And I think that's a fair point, something that you know, they should look at. You know, I'm sure that somebody could do that and slice up yeah. this long-term data. Um, 
but I think it's also a bit of a lazy argument um, because you're not you're sort of just putting it in a box and you're not saying oh well maybe there's something to this p par delta after mm -hmm. all. Um, yep. But in terms of you know blood pressure medications, we know that those you know, hypertension is a huge risk factor. It's one of those things that's going to make those cholesterol particles more likely to get into that subendothelial space. Yep. In terms of cholesterol medications, you know, we briefly mentioned them earlier, you know, so the PCSK9s, things like ezetimibe um, and the statins. Ezetimibe is really interesting to me because it almost mimics what some uh, what soluble fiber and yep. some plant sterols do, um, just reducing the amount of that biliary cholesterol that's secreted being Very absorbed. And Really, if you look at you know dietary cholesterol, it's maybe 25% of the cholesterol you absorb, and much more of that is actually cholesterol you're producing endogenously that gets absorbed. So, you know, blocking that, you can tend to see about a 20% reduction yeah. in your you know LDL, a little bit less in ApoB for some reason. It seems with, with the zetamide, mm -hmm. uh, but then when it comes to the statins, there's a bit of a nuance, and you know how much statin you need for each person. Yep. Uh, the LDL, a different particle, often carries the triglycerides or the fats or lipids that your body synthesizes, whereas a very large molecule known as chylomicrons usually carries the dietary ones as well. So there's definitely a difference between um, absorbed lipids and then the ones that your body synthesizes or repurposes. When it comes to azetamide, which is also known as zetia, it is very interesting. It is a relatively benign lipid medication and it does not work on uh, directly on HMG COA reductase like statins or testosterone. Ironic, and it does work similar to fiber. Ironically, there's another class of lipid medications that's called fibrates, which does not work as similarly to fiber. It actually works on the PPAR system. Each PPAR agonist, regardless of what receptor it's most specific for, most have a little bit of activity or agonism at the other receptors as well. So it's certainly interesting to see kind of like how the treatments for different things have changed. One major change in the treatment of hypertriglyceridemia or high triglycerides is we used to use those fibrates like phenofibrate much more often and now we usually use derivatives of omega-3 fatty acids similar to uh, ones called ethyl, but essentially um, omega-3s that have a high EPA content. Yeah, it, yeah, I think that's an important distinction because what you get over the counter, um, it may or may not even break down how much EPA and DHA you're getting. Yeah. And if you're getting something that's you know fish oil marketed for brain health, you know it may have a very high DHA content and that's yeah. not gonna do much, if anything, for your cardiovascular risk. Yeah. Um, you really wanna have a, a high level. It seems like the trials that use 2,000 to 4,000 milligrams of EPA yeah. are the ones that show the strongest effect. And it's not a huge effect. I mean, you can't stop your statin and start a fish oil. Uh, it's not a fair trade. Um, but you can get a bit of a relative risk reduction, even for your average person, you know, taking um, fish oils. And yeah. you have people, you know, who are, you know, cardiac risk is always something that we're looking at. You know, it's the most common cause of, mm -hmm. of death. Uh, very common for people to have cardiovascular disease in old age when you want to yep. be retired and be able to do things that you want mm -hmm. that you wanted to do be active and you have a couple different trains of thought you have the never medicationers so we'll have to come up with a, a nickname for them um, but they say you know I'll do whatever it takes lifestyle whatever kind of diet I want to you know you have to eat mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want to take any medication and you can get some pretty robust lipid lowering just with lifestyle interventions. Some of the more, you know, um, I guess the more aggressive trials, you can yep. see you know, 30, maybe approaching 40% reduction in yep. LDL and like ApoB. Protocol. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So typically those things are, you know, slashing saturated fat to very near zero, sometimes dietary fat to zero as a whole. Um, there's also fiber is going to be a huge part of that. A lot of times it's, you know, fruits and vegetables and then um, aerobic exercise in particular in combination with weight loss. So in general, you see maybe 5 to 10 percent drop from, you know, a, w a body weight loss of 10 percent. Mm -hmm. You maybe see a 5 to 10 percent drop uh, because of aerobic exercise. Yep. Fiber, you can get a little bit more out of depending where your baseline is. That could be a 10 to 15 percent drop. And then 
with saturated fat really sky's the limit. Like how much were you eating at baseline? Were you eating enough to drive your LDL up to 300? Um, if so, then you've got a great chance of bringing that down if you're eating 200 grams of saturated fat per day. Yeah. Um, the American Heart Association recommends about 10% calories and you'll see these people that are looking at the data and they say, well, uh, we're not doing that bad. We're only eating 12% of our calories from saturated fat. Um, but what they fail to take into account is that we should be eating like 2,000 to 2,500 calories on average and people are probably eating about 3,500 calories on average. So the, the number mm -hmm. of calories from saturated fat is higher than what that percentage would suggest. So you can absolutely reduce your cholesterol significantly through diet. It just depends on how willing you are to stick to that, which is brings us to the other end of the spectrum where people yeah. are like, I want to eat my bacon cheeseburgers. You know, maybe these people are metabolically healthy because they, yeah. they work out hard, they train, they maintain their body weight, um, but they really like saturated fat. You know, I'm somebody that falls into this category. I love uh, good fatty cuts of meat. You know, Ribeye yeah. steak is pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. um, so they say, well, I, you know, I, I want to control my risk factors, but I don't want to limit my dietary intake. Yep. And in those contexts, when you know that you're not going to be able to adhere to something and keep your lipids low lifelong, then sometimes a medication makes sense depending on where the level's at. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's three ways to clean out a drain. One way is you can manually do it with the drain cleaner. One way is you can just dump the drain down, and then you can do a combination of both as well. But as long as you're looking at uh, objective markers and then also your risk factors and coming up with some sort of strategy that's reasonable, um, that's okay to do. It just seems like um, that a lot of people don't realize that, uh, and I'm as natural as everybody comes, so very natural, you know, lifestyle interventions, the six pillars are more powerful than any medication or supplement. But at the end of the day, the most natural thing that happens to us is that uh, we age cellularly and our protein folding is worse and our mitochondria get older and our telomeres shorten and we turn into dust and we die. So prolonging that process for whatever hand that we've been dealt is a perfectly normal thing to do. And I think it's um, quite normal to use tools as well, just like we use tools in most other areas of our life. Technology has gotten a lot better and we know a lot more um, through publishing clinical literature. So that's something to keep in mind for the fellow naturalists out there. Yeah, I think it goes without saying that the six, pillar, the six pillars are going to be your foundation. You know, lifestyle is what you want to tackle first, and then whatever markers you need to move into the right range, or whatever you know, tools you want to use to optimize mm -hmm. how you feel and function, um, then that's a discussion about, okay, you know, what are the risks and what are the benefits, and then you know, uh, the time, like what's the duration going to be on this? Because as you mentioned, you know, the most natural thing is to, you know, get heart disease, have a vascular event and die or be disabled. Yep. Um, so I think, you know, natural is great up to a point. That's a great foundation. That's going to mm -hmm. cut it for, I would say, 75% of people. You can really improve most of your health markers through yep. the lifestyle pillars. Um, but there are a subset of people that, you know, they can't optimize one pillar. Or, you know, they have their, their vices, we all do. Mm -hmm. um, so in those cases, different interventions, you know, make sense. And uh, this is probably a, a, another rabbit hole. But you, you think of, you know, uh, women in menopause is another natural phenomenon. It's natural to, for women. Up to 80% of them you know, will go through menopause and have symptoms, vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, and be quite un uncomfortable to put it lightly mm -hmm. uh, some have more severe symptoms um, depression cognitive impairment um, and that's very natural um, yep. so you know, we get questions all the time about you know uh, women asking you know what can I do to treat my you know, menopause symptoms naturally um, and you know, I, I think we'll just save that for another podcast because that'd be something mm -hmm. to really dive into and talk about you know what is and isn't considered natural and what's yep. natural to one person may not be natural to another. True, and everything over the counter is not natural and vice versa. <laughs> so a teaser would be you can treat the symptoms naturally, but at this time in humans, there does not appear to be anything that will take a um, ovarian failure. That's what menopause is, is ovarian failure. Not It's not a failure on anybody's part, but <laughs> there's no way to reverse that at this time. Yeah, and it's exciting to think about what the future might hold with regenerative medicine, you know, I'm listening to some regenerative medicine you know, talks and you know, experiences people have had. It's certainly progressing very rapidly. It is. 
Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll sort of tease that. Uh, we will talk about you know, women's hormones in depth and menopause, mm-hmm. PCOS, because we get a lot of requests for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps that's another podcast that we go into. But yeah. I figure that's a good a place of any to end it today. Absolutely. Absolutely.